the marathon continues. And we've talked a lot earlier on about extinction of sound. It is now the great moment um, of the participation of Chris Watson. It's my immense pleasure to call to the stage Ian Pate. Ian will introduce Chris Watson. Ian is the producer of the marathon and has, has actually worked with our public programs team for now more than two years, producing all our park nights on Friday in Smiljan Radic's pavilion, and Smiljan is of course here, our architect, and also the 89 plus marathon is a production Ian did, and of course this year's Extinction Marathon. Chris and Ian have known each other for many, many years, and they have been working on a project together that takes place next week, so I, we thought it would be wonderful that Ian would introduce Chris. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Ian Pate. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to introduce Chris Watson. Chris has made sound recordings all around the world, and he's made work um, that's been presented in television, in film, in radio, and in art installations. He's won numerous awards, including a Paul Hamlin Foundation Award for Composers, the Award of Distinction at Prix Ars Electronica, and BAFTAs for Best Factual Sound for the BBC series Frozen Planet and the Life of Birds. This evening, Chris will be presenting a composition composed of a sound recording he made of starlings murmurating on 7 Estuary in 2008. Over the last year, I've been working with Chris on a project called Hraffen, Conversations with Odin. Hraffen um, is an onomatopoeic Norse word for raven. The project is supported by Forestry Commission England and Gerwood Charitable Foundation, and it takes place in Kielder Forest, Northumberland, next weekend. Each evening for our event, just before sunset, we'll walk with our audience into the woods. And along the way, we'll tell them about the history of the forest, how long it's been there, and why we started planting forests in this country in the early 1920s. We'll tell them about the ravens that have been nesting locally for generations and even before the forest was planted. And we'll also tell them about raven mythology, how they appear in different cultures around the world, and in particularly the story of the Norse god Odin and his ravens, Hugin and Munin. And once their audience arrive in the deepest part of the forest, they'll settle down on the floor and they listen. And they'll hear the sound of 2,000 ravens gathering overhead to roost. At first, they'll hear the distant calls arriving, and then the birds come in pairs, in tens, and then hundreds. And once they're all there, the birds begin their very distinct chatter, and they will hear what Odin heard in the halls of Valhalla. When the roost comes to a natural close, the audience is guided out in the forest near darkness. Hraffen has been created from a recording that Chris made in Anglesey at a roof that no longer exists. Like so much of Chris's work, this project brings attention to an aspect of nature that might otherwise be overlooked. It slows the pace of experience for its audience, and it celebrates the beauty of sounds found in nature. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Chris Watson. Thanks, Ian. That's really good promotion for next week. That's great. I hope we can make it. Um, in the 1950s, the Royal Air Force um, developed or were developing an experimental system for locating aircraft using radio signals. This was radar, um, radio detection and ranging. And they had a station at Bushy Hill in Essex, um, 30 or 40 miles from here. And this radar station had a, a range or covered an area of about 5,000 miles um, around all around the southeast coast of England, the Channel, and across London. And it was a relatively unsophisticated system. Radar was in its inf in infancy. And what happened was, apart from picking up aircraft, this radar system also detected unknown and unidentified objects, some of which, of course, became the famous UFOs. But some of the patterns that were picked up had a seasonal nature to them in that they occurred at this time of year in autumn and winter. And not only that, they occurred at this time of day. That's why we're playing this piece now. 
six o'clock, round about sunset, as the light was falling. These patterns would appear on the radar operator screens as mobile concentric circles, which would shift direction independent of wind and weather conditions and range in altitude. Now, at the time, of course, this concerned the military and the RAF because it was a period at the beginning of the Cold War and the military were very wary in case those pesky Russians had devised some particular aircraft technique that could sneak in into Britain's airspace. So more often than not, when the first ring angels were identified, as the radio operators call them, they would send fighter aircraft out to look for these objects. And of course, they never found them. Invariably, they were on, um, in countryside, bordering urban environments all around <coughs> London. The operators call them ring angels because they would disappear when, uh, um, when the aircraft went out to look for them. And it was some time before they were identified as what you're going to hear shortly, um, starlings, tens, hundreds, and sometimes roosts of over a million starlings would gather around London in the 1950s. And that's what the, um, the radar was picking up. Nowadays, these roosts, the ring angels in particular, have passed into history. They've been removed by technical innovation from radar screens. So they're now extinct from radar screens, but they still exist in the real world. And the thing that interested me was that the real starling roosts are also significantly declining, a bird that was once regarded as a pest and was tried to be eradicated from, from some areas, um, has been reduced in numbers. We've lost over 70% of our starlings um, since the 1950s. So I was very keen to try and seek out a roost. As, as Ian was describing the raven roost, I'm also keen on large gatherings of birds, the sounds contained within the movement and patterns, as well as the behavior, and of course the vocalizations. So I found this roost, there are very few large roosts left now in Britain. I found one on, um, as Ian was saying, on the Severn estuary, and put a very particular microphone, a surround microphone, in the center of the roost, in the center of the circle of these ring angels, which is the position you're going to be in tonight. Oh, I wanted to record these sounds from the inside out, which is what we're going to experience. So there's a circular, um, a roughly circular surround system around us, and the speakers will be pointed into the walls and away to try and diffuse the sound. So we get the sense of being in amongst this reed bed where the recording was made. And it's a habitat very similar to the ones around Kensington Gardens and Hyde Park and the Royal Parks, where there used to be very significant roosts of starlings, which have now passed into history. Ironically, some of the roost sites have been replaced by the ring neck parakeets, which are flying around this building now, starting to roost. So the microphone was in the center and left there. It was established there well before the birds return in the early afternoon. So what you first hear is this very diffuse sound of whispering in reeds, the mechanical sounds of reed singing in the afternoon breeze. Um, and then the arrival of small groups of birds like pheasants and blackbirds, water rails, and then slowly but surely the onset of first hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands and then over 100,000 starlings descending into a space not much larger than, than the area that we're in now. The piece lasts about 18 minutes, but it's a time compression that a real starling roost lasts about 90 minutes, which I wasn't allowed to have this afternoon. But I was quite keen to actually install these starlings in this space at the time when it actually occurs. It's, it's quite hardcore, I'll warn you. It's, um, it's being in a place where we would never be or can never be because our presence would affect the behavior. But an, an inanimate object such as a microphone is ignored by these birds because for them, what you hear is this literally life and death struggle. A significant proportion of the birds don't survive overnight in these roofs. It's really a battle for survival. The ones that get in the center get the warmth when it gets very cold, but they also are the ones that avoid predation because around such this 
a large collection of birds mobile food effectively for some, for some other birds like birds of prey. There are sparrowhawks, peregrine falcons, and buzzards nailing individuals as they come in. So these birds are scrabbling for the life. The other thing that happens is that you hear, as Ian alluded to at the start, the collective noun for starlings is a murmuration because that's how we normally hear it in the distance, the sound of the wings. From your position, what you'll hear it as a huge breaking waves on a beach or pounding surf as these birds fly into the reed stems in their thousands. So we'll discontinue murmuration for this evening. What I'd like to present for one night only, alongside the Sacral Gallery, is a, a, a collection of ring angels. Thank you. <laughs>